Really? For some reason. You were able to open the slides and get them? Were you able to? Which ones? The neuro. Oh. Okay. Well, well I think actually, it's just... I actually didn't open them myself. Someone else was already in the computer okay, lab. Okay, so print. I think it's just really slow to open them. Oh, yeah, no. People definitely put them up before. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Making room for more. <laughs> it's just really slow to open. I, I turned it on. Yeah, we're just trying to hope the slides won't pull up. Oh. All right, let's give it a little bit more time. Okay, then when we get started, folks, uh, the slides, it's an awful lot of them, so I think it's probably taken a little longer than usual to open them up. Did anybody have any trouble opening the neuro slides off a of blackboard? No. Okay. I know I heard about the vascular slides not having sound. Somebody's working on that, so I'll, I should have an announcement from you soon. Uh, we may have to take them off and reload them. Okay. But um, I did hear from that. Okay, well, that's trying to still load up. A um, couple things. I just got the batch from Dr. Moran, so I'll be finishing grading the exam. On first glance, um, you did a pretty good job on this round. Um, I know there was some angst with the room changes. Um, that was uh, regrettable. Talk to Dr. Moran. I know you guys are concerned about two things. I know you're concerned about the angst with the fact that we had to last minute change rooms. I know you're also concerned about going into the final with the 73. Um, mean of the written exams, not the collaborative. So um, we've batted some ideas around. I think this might be helpful. This is the direction we would like to go in, is to introduce a fourth testing session, so an exam four, to break up the, the next group of materials, starting with neuro, um, is awfully large. Neuro itself is often hard to, to you know, take on. So if I was to break up, say, neuro and vascular, and then clump maybe GI and endocrine, instead of having maybe all four in one exam, breaking them so that there would be a fourth testing opportunity that would probably give you a better chance of success, allow you to bring things up, and then we're batting around the idea, the 73 mean going into the final has to stand. That, that is what the leadership has decided on. But maybe by introducing a fourth testing opportunity, we could allow you to drop one test grade. Okay? Because I can't add on another hundred, because then it would be 121%, and that doesn't work into the grade center. So if we introduced a fourth one, so it would be neuro and something small attached to neuro, and then two <coughs> things attached to themselves in, in the exam four, I think it might give you guys. A, a little bit more heads up, okay? Yes? Um, with regard to the 73 going into the final, yes. um, it's not super specific in your syllabus in saying that, and mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could point that out. Yeah, that was a decision made in, yes. in the summertime. Let me pull up the syllabus. looking through the syllabus, but um, so let me look into that and get it. I want to get started on the lecture if we can, but um, then I'll go through. Yeah, the reason why we did that um, is uh, that came out of a faculty meeting over in the summer, uh, a med search task force faculty meeting um, um, under Dr. Walsh. It was then adopted uh, in the fall when we convened that the core med search courses, so, you know, including things like pharmacology, that you needed to have an average of 73 on your individual exams. So you add your individual exams up, take the average, and to walk into the final with a chance of success, um, you had to walk into the final with a passing mean of 73%. That the final couldn't be the thing that rescues you. 
from failing the course. We wanted you to be successful before going into the final. Okay. And I just talked with Dr. Moran about that. If she wanted that to continue to be the case, and she said yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Oh, I have a small question. Sure. Um, on the collaborative testing, some people got two questions and some people got six. Um, I'm handling that. Okay. That was only one group, okay. and it was because it was Xeroxing. Yes, and so we'll handle that with that group. Okay. Yes. Um, I just got from Dr. Moran just five minutes ago the exams that she proctored in the afternoon, so now I will grade them after lecture. Okay. And, and then I also want to do an item analysis. I've got all that done for the group so far. So I take all the questions and I take and see which questions they got wrong. And then I go back and see how, you know, the, the questions that like two thirds of the class got wrong or half, more than half. I then go back to look, how was it presented in the slides? How was it presented in the textbook? And then make a decision whether there should be room. And that's how we handled the question on the last exam. I do think on first glance is one question that I will, if you, that I can see two ways of answering that NCLEX question. And I probably will give credit if you answer it one of two ways, just like before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If the third exam is going to be November 30th, I have to still work out the logistics on that with Dr. Moran. Okay, we think we think it, it will give you guys a, a good opportunity. Okay, all right. Any questions before we get started? And I'm not sure why this isn't loading. So, oh, okay. Pajamas. Okay, let's pass around. The attendance sheet first as I try to figure out what else. Okay. You want to, since I am so jet lagged, I'm still in Irish time. You want to come on up and help me? We're right back here. Minus it. Okay. 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 Great. Thank you. All right. Let's see what we can do. Okay. Did that help? Or did I just completely mess? Oh, here we go. Let's go. Mm. Let's see if this will work. All right, while that's working on, here we go. Yay, we've got Nero. Okay, why don't you start passing them around? And like always, if anybody wants to be coming into the office to look over your exam, either individually or in a small group, feel free. I'll be here all this week. Okay. Let's just go fix that out. All right, let's start. Let's start from the beginning. Um, I did something different in these slides. Neuro is very, very hard. It's, it's extremely complex system. It's more than a pump. It's more than a bunch of pipes. Um, it's more than you know membranes for gas exchange. It's actually more conceptual and abstract. So instead of doing a lot of narrative slides, I did a lot of visual slides, hoping that that will help you make some of the connection. Um, and, and let's see how it goes. We'll do as much as we can in neuro today. We will continue next week. Let's first go over with a brief um, review of A and P and your section to the brain, okay? Um, and uh, you know your corpus callipsum. Here's your brain stem. Remember, the brain stem is essential for vital functions, for respirations, for heart rate. When we have issues with the brain stem. When we talk later on about brainstem strokes, um, we talk about brainstem herniation and increased intracranial pressure. Um, these folks immediately have problems with respiration and heart rate. Okay, here's your, your um, cerebrum, the bulk of your brain, frontal lobe, temporal lobes on the side, frontals up here, parietals kind of here, occipitals back here. Um, below this, this little pouch here is called the cerebellum. Its main purpose is, is like balance and coordination. So up here is cognition, personality. Okay, this gives you a better feel, okay? So behavior, memory, cognition, uh, language ability, all that is in this big bulk called the cerebrum. This little pouch down here called the cerebellum is balance and coordination. And then this, um, sprout, shall we say. The top part is your brainstem, 
essential functions, heart rate and respiratory rate. And then this becomes, this extends and becomes the spinal cord. So the top of your spinal cord is actually this thing called the brainstem. In terms of the spinal cord, it's divided into sections. And do you see how there's all these different layers here? Okay. Well, later on in a couple of slides, I'm going to show you a dermatome chart, which is how we measure effects of spinal anesthesia by assessing which areas are still numb, which areas have stopped being numb. So each one of these lines corresponds to a certain part of the body. Now, this upper part here is the neck. That's the cervical. You know how you've got this little bump on the back between your shoulders? It kind of ends there. Folks who break their neck, break their vertebrae, and sustain spinal cord injury at this level um, are in a, a dire straits, actually. They become quadriplegic, so they lose fine movement, fine function. Um, they obviously have problems with respirations because they've lost a lot of function down there. Um, they can have instability of heart rate and blood pressure. So this is when we talk about cervical neck injuries and how it's so important to stabilize that neck immediately is to pre prevent, prevent further damage. Back here, this is thoracic. So this is about where your, your rib cage is, the back part of your rib cage. Um, and so any damage here can cause paraplegia, meaning loss of function below the site of injury. Obviously, folks that have a high, a T1 injury, are going to have it worse than a lower injury, okay, a lower um, thoracic injury. T1 injuries up here, um, those folks have respiratory problems also because it's so close to the cervical spinal cord. And then you can have lumbar. Okay? Uh, lumbar uh, the spinal cord injuries result in paraplegia also, but paraplegia starting about the, the thigh level. Okay? And then these are the neurons. These are the little devices, or the little things that, um, that carry over. They bridge the world of neuro and the bridge of ortho, shall we say. Okay? So these neurons are for signal transmission, impulse transmission. So they're embedded here. The terminal branches of the neurons are embedded into your muscles, your voluntary muscles, for example. So the impulse is carried off the spinal cord, actually into the muscle. And if the muscle is healthy, the muscle will respond. Similar to cardiac, when we talk about if, the, if there's healthy myocardium, it should respond to the impulse, if the impulse can be delivered. Okay? When we talk about neurodeteriorating diseases, we'll talk a lot about destruction of the sheath that covers um, this essential part. Okay? The axon is that actual road that the impulse travels. To protect, protect the axon, it's covered with an outer covering called the myelon sheath. And when we talk about diseases such as multiple sclerosis and ALS, the destruction is in that myelon sheath. Okay. This is a dermatome chart. So those of you um, who deal with post-op patients or ladies who have had a cesarean under spinal anesthesia, um, when you recover those individuals, as you're monitoring them post-surgery, and the effect of the spinal is wearing down, you're checking the level of dermatomes that are, st the level or the area of dermatome that is still numb versus has stopped being numb. So you will see something called a dermatome there. And this is just for awareness. This isn't, this isn't a testable thing, okay? Um, okay? Let's talk about neuroassessment. And that can be difficult, so I tried to break it down into some themes for you. So level of consciousness, when we talk about level of consciousness, the first thing you need to do is ask the question, did this person have intact level of consciousness before the event? Um, I do remember a situation in Mass General where the resident made such a big deal that the patient was confused, and after about 20 minutes, he ran and raven that the patient was confused. One of the older, far more experienced nurses said, um, he's been confused for the last 30 years. This is nothing new. Um, and so make you know, if this, if, if you're seeing confusion and disorientation, is this because of the current event or did it predate the current event? Always check that. In terms of level of consciousness, you want to look at awareness. You want to look at alertness. Um, you want to look at arousal. Okay? If you call out their name, will they respond to that? If you shake them, the shoulders, will they respond to that? Or is the only thing they respond to is pain? 
Obviously, the intact person, if you call their name, they will respond to that. They will look towards who spoke their name. If somebody requires pain for arousal, um, that's, that's a poor condition. Awareness. Glasgow Coma Scale is something I'm sure you guys have seen before. It does have some limitations with it. The lowest score in a Glasgow Coma Scale is not zero, it's three. So as it was put to me once, um, even a corpse will rate a three on the Glasgow Coma Scale. Okay, so take that into consideration. There are alternatives in terms of assessing uh, level of consciousness and responsiveness, but the Glasgow Coma Scale remains the most common tool that we do have. But remember, its lowest grade is not a zero, it's a three. And seven is considered coma. Look at vital signs. Because of that brain stem, changes in neuro condition will affect vital signs. And when we talk about increased intracranial pressure, we'll talk about Cushing's triad and how changes occur in blood pressure and heart rate. Okay. So what's heart rate? What's blood pressure? What's respiratory rate? Okay. How is the airway? Is it patent? Can they breathe normal or are they breathing funny? Are they breathing shallow? Or are they breathing in this crazy irregular pattern? So consider of that. Um, these are some worrisome signs that you may see in, in neurological conditions. Pupils. First make sure before you check pupils that the person isn't coming in with an abnormal pupil anyway. There are a fair amount of folks out there who've had childhood eye diseases. So one pupil always seems to be somewhat dilated and is fixed because of something that happened to him as a child. So make sure that the pupils that you're seeing now just don't, there wasn't an acquired defect to them. You're looking at shape, you're looking at symmetry, you're looking at response to light and accommodation. So what is the shape of the pupil? It should be round, okay. it should be equal in size, and it should be equal in reactivity. So if I flash a flashlight into the right eye, it should react the same way as when I flash a light into the left eye. When I bring um, a, a finger to the nose, both eyes sh should respond to that. Both pupils should respond to that. Okay. Uh, what you don't want to see is a fixed and dilated pupil, um, pupils that don't react, and a doll's eye. And I'll show you that. Okay. Motor function, muscle, not only muscle size, but strength, tone, and, and strength against resistance. If I was to say, you put your hand down here and you say, pull your arm up as I'm trying to push down. That gives you a better idea of how well those muscles are stimulated and how well those muscles function. Okay, so it's strength against resistance. Uh, it's mobility. How well do they, can they transfer? Can they walk? Can they stand up on one leg and then switch to the other leg? Balance. Balance is very important. Um, often you'll see them do this test in which they say, stand on your legs feet slightly apart, put your arms up, and then close your eyes. And what do you see? They start to drift over. Okay, so sense of balance, sense of coordination. Sensation and pain is important. There are other sensations besides pain that the patient with a neurological condition can feel. Numbness and painful tingling, which we call paresthesia. Okay, so neuropathy, you don't feel anything. We see that on the feet of our diabetic patients. The tingling, and that tingling can be so intense it can actually be painful. Numbness, phantom limb pain we talked about. Uh, general pain, like you know the pain of head trauma, the severe headache that comes with concussion, contusion. And there is a very severe headache which comes with intracranial bleed and increased intracranial pressure. And then finally, some miscellaneous things that are also important to assess. Their speech, the quality of the speech, and the appropriateness of their speech. When we talk about aphasia in stroke patients, the speech is affected, but it can be affected one way or the other. When we say expressive aphasia, it means they understand what you're saying, but when they try to respond to you, they try to express themselves to you, they're coming up with garbled words that make no sense. They understand what you're saying, but they can't respond in an articulate, appropriate manner. That's called expressive aphasia. Receptive aphasia means that what they're hearing from you is garbled, but they can respond in a perfectly articulate sentence, um, which may or may not have anything to do with what you ask them. Okay, so aphasia can be in two directions. In terms of the face, is there drooping? Are there twitches? Is there tremors? 
in terms of the gag, is it there? And is the swallow. Speech and swallowing are very tightly connected. If there's a problem with speech, there may also be a problem with swallowing. That's why speech therapy are experts in both speech and swallow capability. Okay, some pupils. Here's our normal, slightly constricted. Sorry, normal, constricted, dilated. Okay, so this is normal, constricted, dilated. All right. This gives you another example. Okay, what do lights? What do pupils do when you flash a light at them? What do they do? They constrict down. They protect themselves. Okay. So with light, and it's a quick light. Okay, a quick pen light. Um, the pupil should very quickly constrict. Okay. Um, in darkness, what do pupils do? They open up. So dilate in darkness, constrict with light. Okay. Ideally, both eyes do the same. Okay. Cranial nerves are awful to try to remember. I saw this and I thought it makes, made so much sense. There's actually a drawing, roughly where the cranial nerves are. Okay. And so these numbers is where you look in the body and look up here and this will tell you what number is affected. And then say, look, uh, number one here is where the nose would be on the face. It's the olfactory cranial nerve. To test it, you ask them to sniff. Okay. So I think this chart will help you a lot. In and then I found this. I'm not sure it's terribly politically correct, but it might be helpful with memory. Okay. And just, it creates, you know, just read off and it creates a sentence. And if you can just remember that sentence, then you may have a chance of remembering which cranial nerve. On the test, I am not going to go as deep as how do you test somebody for cranial nerve three. Okay, you guys aren't neuro residents. I'm not training you to go into a neuro ICU. Just the general. Some gen, you know, gen, the, a question might be, give me some general directions you can use to assess the patient's cranial nerve function. Okay, and it might be sniff, it might be smile, it might be shrug your shoulders. But I'm not going to ask you for cranial nerve eight, what are you going to ask the patient to do? Okay, I, I don't think that's necessary at this point in time. Now there's something called posturing. This is posturing. Okay? This is serious injury to the brain, to the upper part of the brain stem where it starts to move into the spinal cord. This you'll see in massive head trauma. Okay? This was seen when President Kennedy was assassinated. If you look over um, the report and the report of the ER doctors, they talk about President Kennedy being in a um, decerebrate and, and then moving into a decorticate position. Okay, severe head trauma. And what you see in decorticate position, everything is extended, the feet are pointed, the legs are turned in, and you get these crazy hands that move up. The hands are in a C position, and they move up like this. Okay? Now, how I remember this is there's an O in decorticate, there's an O in spinal cord. So this means that if somebody presents in the ER in a decorticate position or decorticate posturing, that there's serious problems with the top part of their spinal cord, okay? the, the corticospinal tracts. Okay. Decerebrate, everything is extended. And I remember all the E's, E in decerebrate, E in extended. So the arms are extended, everything is tight. The, the feet are still pointed, but they're not so internally rotated. Okay. And then this slide is another example. And it tells you, Decerebrate results from damage to the upper brain stem. Okay. Okay, so kind of like behind the head. Okay. All right. And remember in President Kennedy's case, he was shot in such a way several times that the back of his head was blown off. Okay, so this is why he was in this position. Okay. So and then into corticate, damage to one or both spin corticospinal tracts. Um, this you probably will see in the emergency room more than anything. This is not something that usually happens up in the ICU. This usually happens upon presentation. And if it happens on presentation in the ED, it's usually a poor prognostic indicator. But you'll see in neuroassessment, or we'll ask for something called posturing. Is the patient posturing? 
And that's what it means. Are they presenting in one of these two positions? There's actually a third position, and that's called flaccidity. It means everything is just limp. This is like the end, the terminal position. Okay. Uh, so this, this is, you know, when things are just completely gone. So we move in this direction. All I'm asking you is to recognize when we say posturing, that the patient presents in one of three postures, decerebrate, decorticate, or totally flaccid, and that none of them are good. Okay. Moving into seizures. Uh, they're the old term for seizures and the British term for seizures is um, convulsions. Okay. Uh, we tend to use the term seizure in this country. Picture it as fireworks within the, cer um, the cerebrum. So instead of being an organized electrical discharge uh, that goes in an orderly, regular, predictable fashion, ending up in muscles, and the muscles do what the nerves ask them to do, we have this absolute fireworks of explosion, excessive, inappropriate, unexplainable. Okay? So that excessive stimulation that's going on in the brain is going to manifest itself in strange physical behaviors of the muscles. I think that's probably the easiest way to remember it. Seizures by themselves are usually self-limiting. The patient actually stops breathing in a seizure. And so carbon dioxide builds up, and it's that hypercapia state that actually stops the seizure in most patients. So if you've ever seen somebody in a seizure, they do get a little cyanotic, um, and then the seizure stops. When the seizure does not stop, that moves into something called status elepticus. We're going to talk about that later. Okay? But just remember seizures, inappropriate, excessive, unpredictable, electrical discharge. It has no purpose, and the body responds um, with crazy movements. Um, okay? Seizure is a symptom. It is not a disease. Now, there is a disease we call epilepsy. And epilepsy means the, the, their seizures are chronic. And there may be several reasons why, but epilepsy is the term we use when somebody presents with chronic repeated seizures. And we do recognize it as a disease at this point in this country. But seizures themselves are more a symptom of something else than a disease in itself. And you will see them in certain conditions. One of the first signs that, credit, that Senator Ted Kennedy had a brain tumor is he fell to the ground and he had a seizure in the Capitol building. Prior to that, no one knew. He didn't know. Okay? So it could be that. It could be tumor. You see it in strokes. At the time of the stroke, you see it in, in um, the traumatic brain injury. You can see it uh, when there's been um, an intracranial hemorrhage. In the med surge floor, if you're involved with folks that are, um, oh, they come in with excessive alcohol inebriation, a long-standing history of binge drinking, uh, you'll see this either in the med surge setting or potentially in a rehab or detoxification center. If they have been serious binge drinkers and you're drying them out under controlled circumstances in the med surge floor, you've got, them, you've got them in IV fluids with vitamins to rehydrate them, you've got them on around the clock sedatives like, like Librium, and they're shaking with the delirium tremors. The, risk we keep, the reason why we keep them on Librium for those first 48, 72 hours of, de of acute detox is because there's a high risk of them having a seizure. And seizures during alcohol detox are very difficult to stop and difficult to, to turn around once they start. So when you're drawing somebody out in an acute med surge environment or a step down, make sure that they have around the clock sedatives plus a rescue. So if they're on a Librium dose around the clock and they're still shaking like crazy, they need a rescue dose of something extra, like maybe some Ativan, okay? Because we want to control those to reduce their seizure risk. And they should be on seizure precautions until they stop shaking. And I'm sure Dr. Merritt has talked to you about this when she went over psych. Okay. Uh, fever, you see fever, uh, fever convulsions, especially in children. Electrolyte imbalances as well. So they are more the symptom of something rather than the disease. In a, a small number of patients, they are isolated and they're idiopathic. They happened once, 
We can't explain it. It never has happened again since then. So that's what we call isolated idiopathic. And once again, if the seizures present in repeated cycles on, on a chronic nature, we do call it, ep ep we do call it epilepsy. <laughs> And at that point, they're looking at the neurotransmitter GABA, um, whether there's some um, problems with its supply and delivery, as well as any kind of structural deficit that may be occurring. Now, seizures, I'm not going to hold you to all of them, but recognize this partial and this generalized. I'm going to ask you to know about simple and complex partial. Now, I've got slides we're going to go over in a minute. And I'm going to ask you to know about tonic-clonic, what we used to call a grand mal. Okay. The rest, I think, are, are not something for entry level. Okay. Simple partial. Let's talk about a simple partial seizure. This one has often been um, oh, misinterpreted, shall we say. In a partial seizure, in a simple partial seizure, the person is still somewhat alert and somewhat awake and aware. Mm -hmm. There may be isolated things going. I've seen patients have twitching of the face, and I've actually seen the face twitch, twitching of the arm. So there's a small area that's twitching. They, too, may have some other kind of symptoms, that, like an aura, or something that will happen before this twitching occurs. Um, some of the patients that I've had have said they smell smoke or they smell garlic. I had one patient who swore she smelled a shrimp being cooked in garlic and butter. Um, so the strange smells, strange sensations. I've heard uh, one patient told me that her right eyebrow would always feel like somebody was pinching it before she had a, some kind of a seizure. So there's some kind of, a, of, of an experience that goes on. These are very short-lasting, and they may be confused or misinterpreted um, as other types of behaviors. So the patient does not lose consciousness. They don't fall to the ground. Um, they may have a strange sensation before they occur, and there might be some, some localized twitching or tremors. The complex seizure is the one that's been misinterpreted. It's also been one that I think has often been used as an excuse in court cases. Oh, he was having a seizure, you know, sort of thing. These are a little bit uh, more complex. Yes, they are aware. Yes, they are conscious. They do not fall to the ground, but they may not always be able to respond to you if you talk to them. Okay, So a little bit more. They're, they're staring off. They're blank. They're kind of zoning out. But when you call to them or ask them something, they just ignore you. Okay. Uh, they might be clumsy. They may be walking in a strange way. You see that? These two are short-acting, uh, and then they tend to get a little fatigue after a while. Um, and these, as, as this indicates, may be misinterpreted in terms of, of some adverse behavior, drunkenness, <coughs> drug abuse, or aggressive behavior. Uh, but the clue is, is they're still standing upright, they're still conscious, um, but they kind of zone out. Okay. Now, here's the biggie. Okay, this is the grand mal, or the other name for it is called clonic tonic. Clonic tonic means that they will move in two, in, there are three phases of this seizure. Uh, actually four. In the beginning, they may or may not feel an aura. An aura is some kind of sensation, some kind of sound, some kind of feeling that always happens to them before a seizure. This also sometimes is reported by people who have severe migraines. If any of you have severe migraines, you may know that there's a feeling that occurs. And my daughter Lucy, she always feels dizzy before a migraine hits. For me, my right eye starts twitching. Okay? There's some kind of an aura. Once again, it could be a smell, it could be a feeling. Okay? And so they know that something's coming. And if this has happened habitually, they know that when this comes, they need to stop the car or they need to go find a place to sit down. Okay? Um, so they will often try to protect themselves before this occurs. Then they move into the second phase, which is the, the tonic phase. Just remember thinking tone. Everything tightens up. So think T for tone, T for tonic, T for tightens up. Everything becomes rigid and stiff, like every muscle in their body is tightened up as hard as it can go. Um, there, you'll see the neck, the head and neck hyperextend. You'll see the arms become incredibly rigid. You'll see the jaw lock in place. 
At this point, they usually um, have, have lost consciousness or in the process of, and they tend to fall. And then after a minute of this, then you move into the clonic phase. And this is the repeated jerking phase of the seizure. Okay. This is the more visible phase. So there's rhythmic jerking of all extremities. They do, I mean, they're shaking all over, but they're tight as a rock and shaking at the same time. Okay, so if you, if you hold on, if you touch them when they're doing this clonic movement, the muscles are rigid. Okay, but everything is just shaking. Okay. During this time, they may be, they're still unconscious. They may be incontinent, usually of urine, more so than stool. They may have bit their tongue or bit their lip. So there may be some blood coming out. They also tend to, to drool because they're not swallowing during this time. So the excess saliva, so this is why people say foaming at the mouth. No, they're not foaming at the mouth. They're, this is just the saliva that's in their mouth that's being shaken out of their mouth and their pharynx because they're not swallowing. They're also not breathing. So they may have some, some cyanosis. But remember, it's that hypercarbia from that apneic period that usually triggers the seizure off. And then they move into the fourth and last phase of the seizure, which is called postictal. And, and they, they are exhausted. Their body has had it. They are sleepy. They are lethargic. In some cases, they're also confused. It's like running a 26.2 marathon in three minutes. Okay? And so they're absolutely exhausted, and they sleep it off. During postictal, they usually breathe fine. The color comes back to their face. They've got regular spontaneous breathing, although you might want to put a little bit of oxygen by nasal cannula on them, protect them, get them into the sidelining position, suction out their mouth, um, and when they wake up, they may have a little bit of confusion at that time too. Okay? So when you hear the term, they're sleeping off a seizure, it's the post-ictal phase. If um, they are deeply affected in the post-ictal phase, you may or may not have to put in an, a nasal or oral airway. I prefer the nasal. I prefer the nasal for a number of reasons. It's easier to get in. Um, also, if one seizure has happened, who's to say another one won't happen? And if they seize with this massive plastic block in their mouth, they could break their teeth and then aspirate their teeth. So I think in a post-dictal phase, I mean, my opinion is a clinspec, the nasal pharyngeal airway is the way to go. If they re-seize with that in place, they're not going to break teeth, have mouth injury. Okay, it's real simple. All right. So, just some pictures. Here's that tonic phase. Everything tightens up. Arms are rigid. Everything is rigid. The head gets thrown back. The back arches. Now we move into this clonic phase, this repeated shaking. The whole body shakes as one. Okay. I saw this, and no, it's, it, I got this actually um, from the pediatric clinic at Walter Reed, because they have a lot of kids with seizures. And so this actually wasn't a politically incorrect thing. It's something that they use to educate the children and the families. And they do it with Bart Simpson. Okay, so this might make sense to you. The aura phase, the tonic phase, the clonic phase, and then the postictal, the sleep phase. Okay. Status epilepticus, life-threatening, um, probably happens more often than it should. This is when the seizure does not stop or the seizure repeats itself several times within a time frame of, of 30 minutes or more. If you cannot stop a seizure within 10 minutes, there's a risk of brain damage. So you've, these are really crisis situations when the seizure does not stop after its usual one, one minute or so. So status epilepticus is a seizure that lasts more than five minutes, one seizure episode more than five minutes, or has repeated as another seizure and another seizure within three minutes, sorry, within 30 minutes. I've seen the patient, the seizure stop, two minutes later, another seizure, the seizure stops, another two minutes, so this repeated cycle of seizing. It is, tends to be refractory to standard treatment. It may not respond as well to a usual moderate dose of Ativan or Valium. It takes a lot more drugs to stop it. The reason why it's concerning is that in most cases it is preventable. Um, the biggest thing is people stop taking their meds or they don't take their meds at the same time each day. Okay. So there's a problem with the serum drug level of the anticonvulsant that's on board. Um, 
as I said before, we talked about the detoxifying the alcohol inebriated patient without adequate sedation. This is a risk of that, is status epilepticus. You can also see it in head trauma, cerebral edema, which we'll talk about later, serious electrolyte imbalances, but the most common cause is they've stopped taking their drugs or they stop taking their drugs at regular times. Okay. Unfortunately, this tends to happen in adolescents because some of the drugs, particularly dilatin, have side effects that a growing teenager really doesn't want to experience. The excess gum growth, the excess facial hair. Okay. And so they tend to tell the mother, yeah, I took my pills, and then they, they don't. Um, so this is usually an indication. Fortunately, now there are a lot more drugs available for these kids than the original Dilantin. And some of these other drugs have less side effects than Dilantin. So hopefully compliance will be better. Some of the drugs that are used. Now, there's a ton of drugs used for seizures in general. I only pulled out the big ones that are used for tonic-clonic. I figure you can't memorize 50 drugs, so we'll just pull out those for the grand mals. Tegretol. Remember, some of these drugs are used for other purposes as well. Tegretol and Neurontin, for example, are used for chronic nerve pain. Um, so the first four are actually what we would consider anti-seizure medications. Tegretol is a common one, but it has some side effects. You can notice there's some serious side effects with all of these anticonvulsant medications. In terms of Tegretol, it can make people dizzy, it can make people very tired and drowsy, it can cause a headache, give you some blurred vision, the biggest thing, though, is it can drop your white blood cell count. So you're going to have to have lab tests to make sure that your CBC is still okay. Neurontin, common drug used for chronic nerve pain, can increase appetite, leading to weight gain. It can also make you unsteady on your feet, make you dizzy, drowsy, fatigued, and, and irritable to be around. Depakote, Depakote can cause your hair to fall out, can give you tremors, can also alter your clotting so that you bruise easily. And then, of course, the traditional one, which is Dilantin. One of the last slides, I have two sli KSA slides for you. One of the KSA slides is Dilantin. So it's at the end of the lecture. Um, in, di in terms of Dilantin, when there's an active seizure going on in place, the first thing we do is give people sedatives or serious muscle relaxants to stop the seizure. So the Ativan, the Valium, phenobarbital, not as often as we used to know. The next thing we do is we get them on a loading dose of Dilantin. So what you'll see first things to stop the seizure by relaxing the muscles, and then we're going to get them started on Dilantin. We'll give them a loading dose just to get it on board, and then we'll do the maintenance dose after that. Fortunately, there is another drug out on the market. Dilantin is brutal to give, brutal to receive. Um, unfortunately, for a long time, it was the only thing out there that was available. For example, it does not mix with any other drug. It does not mix with glucose. So you could only give it diluted in saline. And you had to use a dedicated line only. And if it got in contact with anything of a sugar nature, it would crystallize. It crystallizes easily anyway. So the first thing you should do is look at the vial and look to see if it has already crystallized. Then you needed to pull it out of the vial with a filtered needle because it does have a tendency to crystallize. Okay. The other thing is if you gave it too fast, or were unlucky, even if you were giving it slow, it could drop that patient's blood pressure very significantly. All these things are on your KSA, so you don't need to, to go crazy. Um, but it was the only drug out there. Now, fortunately, there is another version of Dilantin that is easier and safer to use, and that's phosphenatoin, okay? or Cerebix. It is a phenotone equivalent, a Dilantin equivalent. It's more compatible. It's easier to give. It's not as reactive. And it has less risk of hypotension. Okay. So I'm just introducing this. These last three drugs are what we will use to relax the patient and stop the clonic part of the seizure. So the last three are not anti-seizure medications, not anti-convulsants. They're muscle relaxants used in an acute situation. All three of them are what we considered controlled substances, so they need to be locked up. Okay? And all three of them are such strong, well, the doses you will use plus the drug are so strong that you need to watch airway, breathing, and circulation if you give them. Okay? Sometimes it takes a fair amount of Valium to stop a seizure. 
So ideally, depending upon how much of the valley of the seizure, the phenobarb, that they got to stop the seizure, um, they probably need to go into the ICU just to be monitored. They've had too much muscle relaxant to safely stay on a med surge floor um, with a nurse who has five other patients. Okay, so something to consider. Okay, always question on NCLEX. What is the recovery position post-seizure? Sidelining, okay, no pillow. Okay. Sidelining, face visible, suction nearby. Okay. We tend not to use pillows at this point because what if they had another seizure, turn themselves around and put their face into a pillow? We know during tonic-clonic phase they're not going to be breathing, but what if when they were in that post-ictal phase, their face was in a pillow? Okay, so when they're recovery, we, we prefer to take the pillow away. So side-lying is the recovery position with suction nearby. Let's talk about nursing care. Okay? Anytime somebody seizes, you never leave the room. You can go to the doorway and scream for help from the doorway, but you do not leave a seizure, seizing patient alone in the room. So you, you call for help and you stay with that patient. And the first thing you do is try to remove things around that patient that they can bump into and injure themselves. So if they've fallen on the floor, move the furniture away okay, so that they're not going to you know, headbutt themselves into the furniture. Never force anything into their mouth during a seizure. You will lose you will break teeth. God forbid you put in a tongue blade. They then clench down in that tongue blade, bite it in half, and then aspirate the inside part, of the part that's in their mouth. So nothing gets jammed in their mouth um, during a seizure. Okay. Um, and then afterwards, they're turned. You do vital signs. You do neurovital signs. Um, get them on a pulse oximetry. Consider, depending upon how long the seizure was, depending upon what their O2 sat was, maybe putting them on oxygen by nasal cannula. And then depending upon how deeply lethargic and drowsy they are, consider an oral airway, uh, consider an airway. Of the two, you'll see the book say two, but of the two, I prefer that you go for the nasopharyngeal because should they reseize and their jaw locks down, there's nothing in there for them to break teeth on or bite in half, okay? And then you notify the physician. When you document about seizures, he's gonna ask you to, to make note of what happened before the seizure? Was there any kind of a trigger? Did the patient report any kind of an aura before the trigger? When they fell, which way were they looking? Were their eyes focused straight? Were their eyes focused to one side or the other? They will ask you to talk about, you know, what were the movements like? And obviously in tonic-clonic, it's, it's the generalized movements. Whether was, there was any injury to the tongue or to the lips. Uh, was there incontinence? How long did the seizure occur? And how post uh, ictal they were, how deep they were. Okay. But from this slide, just remember the biggies. You always stay with them. Uh, try to push things away that they can injure themselves by bumping into. Turn them on their side when the seizure is over. Suction their mouth. Get some vitals, check them out. Oxygen. Um, and then if somebody has had a seizure and they're going to stay in the med surge unit until transfer, the smartest thing is that that nurse stays right there in the room and does not leave the room, and that that assignment, the remaining assignment, is absorbed by the other nurses until this patient um, can either wake up and stay awake or gets transferred off. Okay? So if they're in the post-dictal phase, you don't go back and check on your other five patients. That is your patient until they have exited the post-dictal phase. Make sense? Okay. What are seizure precautions? Okay. Uh, you guarantee you're going to see this on the NCLEX. Okay. Prefer preferably a room near the nursing station. If that's not possible, then an assignment in which that nurse is by that patient's room the majority of the time. So maybe she has a cluster of patients. So four rooms in a block. So that, she's, that patient's door is open and she's constantly looking in. Um, or somebody uh, that can be moved closer to the nursing station. You want everybody on staff to know this patient is a seizure risk, including whoever might be manning that desk. This patient might click on that call bell during the aura phase and then not respond when somebody says, you know, what do you need, okay? So somehow who's ever at the desk needs to know that there may be an a, 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 it's a situation in which the call bell goes on 
and the patient doesn't respond, and you need to get down there. The room should have oxygen, uh, a nasal cannula set up, and suction set up uh, with both catheters and a yonker. <coughs> Airways, and I prefer the nasopharyngeal, but you'll see both listed. Um, bed is always in the low position. Now, recently there's been a tremendous debate about do you keep them in bed at all times with all side rails out and padded. Um, you know, hard for somebody to stay in bed like that 24-7. And recently, folks have said, you know, that's really a restraint of, the, of its own. To have somebody stuck in bed with all side rails up and then pat them so that they're like in a cage. So there's been some discussion lately. <coughs> what could be done as an alternative? Some hospitals are putting mattresses or rubber pads on the floor. Um, you still just, just note that it's still being debated. But the important thing is that they're close to nurses, they're visual they're visible, um, and that if they are in bed, the bed is low. We used to put a bag, and I can't even believe we did this. We would tape a bag to the wall that had a padded tongue blade in it, a syringe, an alcohol wipe, and a vial of Valium. You know, how we ever got away with that, I'll never know, because we were taping controlled substances to the wall with a syringe. Now we don't do any of that. <coughs> um, you may want to, by your suction, tape a nasopharyngeal airway. No padded tongue blades, and they are no longer used in seizure precautions. And that's probably what you're going to see on NCLEX. It's got to do with the padded tongue blade. Okay. Number one, you're never going to, in, going to get it into somebody's clenched jar anyway. And number two, if they re-clench, they'll snap that tongue blade off in half, and then you've got a free-floating piece of padding tongue blade in their mouth going to obstruct their airway. If this patient is at high risk for seizures, it's always smart to get a... a IV catheter in them, say a cap saline lock, if they're that high risk, because trying to put an IV catheter into somebody who's jerking all over the bed is impossible. If you have an existing patent one in and something happens, it's very easy to push some meds through it um, rather than try and get something in. So if they are extremely high risk, um, get a patent saline lock in them. And make sure you have seizure medication. It usually is either in your emergency Pixis drawer or it's in the code cart. And a good code cart will have drugs that are for other things, such as seizures, as well as for cardiac arrest. Okay. All right, any questions about seizures? All right, all right, good. Let's move into cerebral edema. Cerebral edema itself, once again, is a symptom. It's not a disease. So it's a symptom of something else that's worse. It could be a new number of things, including head trauma. You also see this in DKA. We're going to talk about endocrine a little bit later on in this semester. When we talk about serious DKA with blood sugars in the 800s, uh, that is a risk for cerebral edema. So anything can trigger it off. But for the purpose of what we talk about in neuro, think head trauma, okay? think stroke, think tumor, think some kind of an allergic reaction. It can also be triggered off by an infectious process. And the biggest one that we're worried about is encephalitis which is infection of the brain itself. Um, meningitis is infection of the lining over the brain, but encephalitis is of the brain itself. And so an infected brain tends to swell. We're going to be talking about those later on. Okay. Um, what you also have to realize is some things make this worse. Okay. Any kind of fever, fever is going to cause the blood vessels to relax, so you always have vasodilation with the fever. If you've got cerebral blood vessels that are then dilating, the cerebral edema is only going to get worse. <clears throat> Hypoxia will make cerebral edema worse, and hypercarbia. Okay. Those three things can make the cerebral edema worse. Cerebral edema is truly a life-threatening situation. This is when you hear about seriously injured patients and their brain has swollen. Okay, Lamar Odom was one of them. He had cerebral edema. That's why he went into a, a drug-induced coma. Okay. okay, this gives you some progression. So here's normal. Okay, here's a normal brain. We've got space between the brain itself and the, and the skull. Now we've got some cerebral edema. When the brain swells, it's going to move outward. So the space between the brain and the skull is going to become very narrowed. So here we have diffuse swelling of brain tissue, 
moving out to the skull. And now we're moving into serious brain edema. That it's, the brain is enlarging, but there's no more room for it to go. It's hit the, the, the boundaries of the skull, and it's still swelling. So that pressure is then going to U-turn it in and go to the center. Very similar to compartment syndrome. Have you guys talked about compartment syndrome? I know we're going to be doing it in this semester. Okay. It's uh, orthopedic injuries. Okay. So in serious cerebral edema, the problem is, is that the brain can, can't swell any more than the size of the skull, but the causes of the edema are still in place. So the pressure goes out. When it can't go out, here it is, it's going out. When it can't go out anymore because the skull doesn't expand, the pressure then comes in, turns around and goes in. What does it do? It then compresses the ventricles, and then it's going in, and if it doesn't have any more room to go, then the pressure goes down. And when it goes down, you herniate your brainstem. Okay. We're going to talk about that separately in a minute. Treatment of cerebral edema. This is an, uh, definitely an ICU situation. Okay. And you have to not only treat the symptom of cerebral edema, but you got to figure out what's causing it and treat the underlying cause. You use whatever's at your disposal. You bring the head of the bed up to use some gravitational force. You need to keep that neck in perfect alignment. Any twisting or the neck can affect circulation, the perfusion going up. ICP monitoring, we're going to talk about that too. Uh, this patient definitely should be intubated. And uh, what we're going to do is just ventilate them very carefully. And we actually want them to be hypocarbic. So we want their PaCO2 to be on the lower side. Remember, a high PaCO2 is going to cause more dilation. So we're going to keep their PaCO2 low, either no low normal or below low normal. We're going to do some drugs. And what's called osmotherapy is very interesting. We're going to use a combination of drugs. Have you ever heard of mannitol? It's an osmotic diuretic. What it does is it has a pulling force to it. So we're going to give them mannitol. And mannitol is going to, because of its concentrated nature, it's going to pull fluid from the tissues into the blood vessel. You're going to dry out the tissues with mannitol. And then we're going to use Lasix to pee off the extra water. When mannitol is used, you dry the, the interstitial tissue, but you raise the volume in the intervascular space. And then you use Lasix to pee off the extra volume in the intervascular space. Does that make sense? OK. We're also going to use hypertonic saline. But we have to walk a fine line between how much mannitol we use and how much hypertonic saline we use, because they're both going to do the same thing. They're going to have a pulling effect. So volume, fluid is going to be pulled from the interstitial tissues into the intravascular space, and then you hope that the Lasix can pull from the intravascular space and pee off the extra water. So you have to be very careful the proportions that you use. But you use mannitol for this purpose. Then you use steroids to reduce the inflammatory process. Mannitol, hypertonic saline, and Lasix will dry off the brain, and then, but steroids will go to the, what's causing the inflammation and reduce that inflammatory. And then we're going to reduce the me metabolic function of the brain as its own. We're going to cool it down, and we're going to put it to sleep. And this is what was done to Lamar Odom. Okay? We're going to cool the patient, bring down body temperature, when you bring down body temperature, you bring down metabolic function. So basal metabolic rate is brought down, and then we're going to put them to sleep. And we use phenobod. And so when we talk about a drug-induced coma, you're using the barbiturate phenobarbital to do that. And by putting them to sleep, you're further bringing down that basal metabolic rate. Okay, so you combine, when you do the, the phenobarb coma, you do the, the drug and the cooling. That way you reduce all the demands on the brain. And then you just have to make sure that blood sugar and, uh, and um, blood pressure are within normal. Okay? Does this make sense? Okay. This is pretty high-tech stuff, guys. So it's pretty good. Um, increase intracranial pressure. Now, 
cerebral edema will increase intracranial pressure. But other things will also increase intracranial pressure. But when you're talking the relationship between cerebral edema and increased ICP, the edema comes first, the increased pressure comes second. But there are other things that cause increased intracranial pressure. What increased ICP means <coughs> is that the mass of the brain is larger than the space of the skull. The skull doesn't expand, not in an adult. Okay? And there is a certain amount of space in there, but when that is his hit, there's no place else to go. So that's why you're very concerned about ICP. Um, unconditional ICP can cause brain damage and cause herniation of the brainstem. So everything is pushing down in that brainstem, compressing it, and actually pushing it out against the skull and out of the tiny, tiny hole at the back of your skull. I'll show you that in a minute. Okay. So increased intracranial pressure that is not controlled will result in death. Common causes, we talked about cerebral edema. Any kind of localized swelling, like a contusion, okay, more than a concussion. Um, hemorrhage, if somebody has a, a stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke, or a ruptured aneurysm, that can do it. And another space occupying an abscess, a brain abscess, and a brain tumor. Did you guys, I don't know if you followed, it was probably last year, the story of Brittany Maynard. Um, okay. The symptoms that she reported were all of increased intracranial pressure. This was a, a lovely young lady in her 20s, recently married. She was a school teacher who was, um, at the time she was trying to get pregnant and start a family, was diagnosed. She uh, was mistreated for migraines until it was detected that she was actually walking around with an absolutely massive brain tumor. Uh, a brain tumor that even though it had been debulked and she had chemo and radiation, that was just being fueled. It just continued to just grow out of. And, and the symptoms she talked about, um, she was a proponent of, of uh, assisted suicide for patients that she believed that should be a decision of the patient. She had a lot to do with the rules in Oregon, well, California now. She actually moved to Oregon because she believed in this. Um, and when they asked her why, she said, because I can no longer live with these symptoms. She, the headache that she reported, the, the horrendous seizures, um, the projectile vomiting, all of those were symptoms of increased intracranial pressure as this massive tumor. And it, in one magazine, they showed a scan of it, and the whole thought, half of her brain was tumor. Okay? The, the space-occupying tumor uh, was just causing her problems, uh, symptoms she could no longer live with. Signs of increased ICP are this. First sign is changes in level of consciousness. And nobody monitors level of consciousness better than neuro IC nurses. They are tremendous at that. They know the slightest change um, that many of us uh, wouldn't even note. Okay? So changes in level of consciousness occur first. Then they report a headache. And just try to just picture your skull is filled to the max and the pressure is still pounding against your skull and how uncomfortable that will be. Then they vomit, but when they vomit, it's projectile vomiting. It can hit the wall, okay? It comes out with such force. When they vomit, they then feel better, okay? Because the pressure has been reduced, at least temporarily. Okay. Seizures, and she reported horrendous seizures, okay? And then there's something called Cushing's triad, and this is always on NCLEX, so big circle this one, okay? Cushing's triad. This is bradycardia, hypertension, and changes in respiratory path. Well, I have a slide in a minute. Changes in pupil reaction and some, something called papal edema. Nurses tend not to look into people's eyes with a scope and check out the retina, retina, but I wanted to show you what that was. In papal edema, okay, here's your optic nerve. This is, not, this is awareness, not for testing. The pressure is so intense that the spine, cerebral spinal fluid around the optic nerve is increased. And the pressure is so intense, all right, here's your normal, here's your optic nerve, that the optic nerve is actually pushed further into the eyeball. This is what a normal retinal should look like, and that's your optic nerve. Here's where the pressure has been so intense that it has pushed the optic nerve root in, actually into the eyeball, and you see this big circle. Okay, you see this? So that's what they're looking for, it's papal edema. 
Okay. Here's your Cushing's triad. Okay, um, systolic blood pressure goes up, bradycardia, and respirations become less, so they reduced respiratory rate. Okay. These are all symptoms of um, increased intracranial pressure. Make note that it's the opposite of what happens in shock. So in shock, you have a decreased blood pressure, decreased heart rate, increased respiratory rate. In ICP, increase, the opposite occurs. Blood pressure, heart rate go up, respirations go down. Okay. Brainstem herniation is what you don't want. Um, this is not something you can pull a patient back from. Okay, this is unrecoverable. Once it happens, it happens. And it usually is, is fatal. You do everything you can to prevent this from happening. This means that that brain has so much pressure in it and on it, and the, it starts to go out, but then it hits the skull. It can't go out. The pressure can't go outward anymore. You turn. It starts to go towards the center of the brain because that's the pattern of least resistance. So it goes to the center first, and then when it can't go anymore, it goes down. And when that force of pressure goes down, it forces the brain stem against the back of the skull by the, that little opening, the foramen, and it either squishes the brain stem against that opening or it squishes the brain stem through the opening. And that's what's called brain stem herniation, and it results in cardiac and respiratory arrest. Okay. Um, and that's, that's an arrest that you, you just can't turn around. Okay. The goal should be prevention. So everything is done to reduce ICP so that this does not happen. Okay, this shows you the directions it can go, when, but most commonly, it goes down here. So all the pressure goes in the downward direction, okay, forces the brain stem against the skull or through the skull. Okay. In terms of monitoring, um, I don't know if any of you are, have been in ICUs that have used ICP monitoring. Um, it's uh, pretty common these days. It used to be pretty uncommon. There are five ways that you can do it, but basically you want to get in there, you need to get on the other side of the skull to try to figure out what the pressure is against the, against the brain. Definitely sterile technique because, man, this is a risk for encephalitis and meningitis. So it is the, the most meticulous is sterile technique for ICP monitoring. Your goal is to keep the ICP consistently under 15. If it goes up, over 20, closer to 30, and it stays there more than five minutes, that could be an unrecoverable situation. Now, uh, the ICP, we say the mean ICP because it's going to move. If you turn the patient, it's going to move. If you have to quickly suction the patient, it's going to go up. So we want the mean, okay, the mean ICP to be less than 15. These are five ways that you can do it. Okay. Uh, you can put in a subdural catheter. You can actually go right, catheter right into the ventricles of the brain. Um, this is probably the most common is the subarachnoid bolt right here. It's probably the most common and the easier to get in place. Now, I'm not going to ask you the nitty gritty of, of you know, which catheter. Just for awareness, just be aware that the subarachnoid, and they often call it the subarachnoid bolt, they're going through the skull just onto the other side of the skull is the most common and the easier one to get in. And if you notice, in this one here, oh, this thing, this bores through brain tissue, which I don't think is ever a good idea. All right. This does not, but it will get you some good readings. <coughs> um, and so this comes out, it goes through a transducer. What you're looking for is something that's below 20, closer to 10, like this is good here, but then do you see it popping up, and then it gets up higher? Okay, so you want to keep it between 10 and 20, ideally closer to 10. Now, the device that they use, they may either be just checking the pressure or they may be checking the pressure and allowing for extra CSF to drain off. So in this case, we're assessing the pressure, the intracranial pressure, but we also have a stopcock in position so that if we need to drain off CSF, we can do so. Okay, in terms of what you, what you do to take care of folks with increased ICP, 
um, very, very stringent, essential. Once that herniation starts, it cannot be stopped. So everything needs to be focused on preventing the herniation. Bed rest. These aren't people you walk in the halls. These are really sick folks. You want them in bed. You want them being quiet. You want them being still. You want to minimize stimulation. Lights down, noise down. You know, um, keep them calm. Keep them in comfortable. These aren't people that you're going to, you know, be up walking to the bathroom or, you know, scrubbing them to get them clean. Okay. In some cases, we didn't even change the linen because it, it spiked them up too high. The linen was clean. We kept it on. Okay. Because we just couldn't do that right now. You want their head and neck in alignment so that there's good CSF flow. And you don't want hip flexion because that increases pressure in the thoracic which then increases pressure on the veins that are bringing blood up to the, uh, um, bringing veins that are bringing blood up to the brain. So you want them head up, but no hip flexion. Uh, definitely ICU, definitely on, on your monitoring. Um, you want to do the minimum tactile nursing care that's necessary. And if that means they don't get a bath, they don't get their linen changed, if that's the safest thing to do, that's the safest thing to do. Okay? Sometimes you have to do that. You don't want to save all the nursing care up and then do everything at once either because you'll spike that ICP up. So you just do absolutely the minimum, including suctioning. Suctioning is done only as needed. Um, if they are awake and not intubated, you prevent them from vomiting, you prevent them from coughing, and you don't want them straining in, at stool. All of those will increase pressure um, and cause them to have problems. Um, fully catheter in place, especially if you're doing that mannitol fluid, Lasix challenge, uh, stool softener. You want them to be comfortable, but you don't want to mask them with the narcotic. You want to be able to assess their level of consciousness. So these are the folks that they're Tylenol or they're half a Percocet or one Percocet. If they are on the vent um, and they're not in a phenobarb coma, they like to use propofol because you can turn that propofol off and these folks wake up in five minutes. And then you can turn that propofol back on after you've checked them, and they quickly go back down again. Um, Anti-seizure meds, obviously they're at risk for that, and keeping their blood pressure and serum glucose um, in control. I think on that we'll stop rather than put you into a stroke and then get it disrupted. Okay? Any questions with what we've covered so far? Okay, I will get some um, practice questions so that you guys can practice on that. Dr. Moran will come back and I will do some further logistics discussion about opportunity for, um, and we'll be back on that as well. Um, and then if somebody could have, make sure you sign the attendance sheet, and I'll have uh, grades up tomorrow, and I um, just need to finish off and look at the questions. <coughs> I talked into your phone. Oh, it's okay. Thank you. What are you doing? I'll send you the. Um, I'll send you the.